astronauts, today we want to learn about paleontology. Me encanta la paleontología. ¿Saben qué es? Claro, es facilísimo. Adelante. Paleontology is the study of pails or buckets. Did you know that Jack and Joe went up the hill to fetch a pail of water? Whoa, 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 perdón? That's definitely wrong. Paleontology is the study of past life on Earth by studying fossils. Or, in Spanish, la paleontología estudia la vida pasada en la Tierra a través del estudio de los fósiles. Sophie is right, Kenneth. <laughs> uh, uh, obviously. Come on, guys, I was just testing you two. Estaba bromeando. A ver, a ver, a ver. Since I answered the first question, Jerry, why don't you tell us what a fossil is? Okay, fossils are the remains or traces of ancient life more than 10,000 years old. Sofia, you got this in Espanol? Sí, claro. Los fósiles son restos o rastros de la vida antigua, con más de 10,000 años de antigüedad. And if it weren't for fossils, we wouldn't know about dinosaurs. And I love dinosaurs. Los dinosaurios son la neta. That's true, Kenneth, but paleontologists study many more things than just dinosaurs. There are fossils of plants, different kinds of animals, even things like footprints. Exacto, that's right. We can tell how dinosaurs walked by studying their fossilized footprints. Podemos saber cómo caminaban los dinosaurios al estudiar sus huellas fossilizadas. And we can tell what they ate by studying the shape of their teeth. Y podemos saber qué comían por las formas de sus dientes. We can also tell what dinosaurs ate thanks to, drum roll please, fossilized poop. Ew. Fossiles de popo, guacala. Pero estudiando esos diferentes fossiles, podemos aprender mucho. By studying these different fossils, we can learn a lot about the environments these plants and animals lived in many, many years ago. Imagínese, podemos saber cómo eran los medios ambientes donde estas plantas y animales vivieron hace años. We'll find out more about what fossils can tell us in a bit. But first, let's talk about how fossils are made. Guys, I think it's time to put Kenneth into the simulator. Awesome, yes! Wait, you're not just gonna dump a bunch of water on me, are you? Kenneth, of course not. Relájate. Okay, I'm in. All right, there are many ways that fossils form. Hay muchas formas en las que se forman los fósiles. But we're gonna focus on what we call permineralization. For this, very specific events must occur. First, primero, el organismo muere. The organism dies. Orale! Don't worry, Kim, it, it's just a simulation. Then, el sedimento lo cubre. The sediment must quickly cover the animal, plants, or in this case, can it. Hey guys, I can't move. Over time, los tejidos se deterioran. The soft tissue deteriorates, leaving just the hard bones. Y quedan puros huesos. Groundwater carrying dissolved minerals fills the voids in the bones. The minerals harden. The fossils become like a rock. Finalmente, el fósil se petrifica. But more importantly for us, a glimpse into the past. Y nos deja echarle un ojo al pasado. You rock, Kenneth. <laughs> Let me out. Okay, Kenneth. Okay, guys, now we know how fossils are formed. Great. It is. But now there's someone I want you guys to meet who's going to tell us what we can learn from fossils. Prepárense para conocer a alguien que sabe muchísimo sobre fósiles en el Museo Perot. Come on. Here we are in the Paleo Lab with Miria Perez, a fossil preparator. Hi guys, I'm so excited to share with you what I do every day. So what are you working on here? As a fossil preparator, I spend my time unearthing dinosaur bones or really any fossil from what we call the matrix or the rock around the fossil. We use a variety of tools and this one is especially my favorite and it's called an air scribe. That's amazing. How long would you say it takes you to unearth them? It really depends. On projects like these, see how big it is? Yeah. It may take a couple months to a year. Oh, wow. That's a long time. Sure. So this is Pachyrhinosaurus proorum, and it kind of looks like a Triceratops, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it does, definitely. Well, instead of the three horns, it has what's called a nasal boss, and that's this like hunk of bone here, and in real life, it would have a very thick padding of skin over it. Oh, that's amazing. That's pretty cool. So all of these little pieces highlighted in red are the things that we have cleaned in this lab. And this oh. one here, I really want to show you this one. It's called the denary or the lower jaw. So if you feel the bottom 
of your jaw, that piece right here, we have a dentary. So this one is complete. Today. So cool. Yeah. And you can touch it if you want, just be very careful. And those little things right there that you're touching are sockets where the teeth would go in. Oh, that's pretty cool. So cool. So um, how did you know that you wanted to work with fossils? I've always loved dinosaurs and paleontology when I was a kid. My mom would take me to the Houston Museum of Natural Science and we'd go see the dinosaurs, see the hall. I started volunteering there when I was 12. 12. <laughs> wow. wow. And I just, I continued that path. I went to college for um, fossils and then I got this job at the Pro Museum. That's pretty cool. That's, That's amazing. Cool. Now, what would you recommend to the kids who are watching this and are interested in paleontology? Sure, so books on paleontology, paleontology on YouTube, and especially going to science museums is a great way for people to learn about fossils. Wow, well, thank you so much, Maria, for showing us your fossils in the lab. Thanks for coming. I'm so happy I got to share with you my passion. Yes, most definitely. <laughs>Okay, why not? We're here at the top floor of the Pro Museum. Dinosaurs! We've been talking a lot about paleontology and fossils, so I thought we should meet a working paleontologist. Meet Dr. Ron, un paleontologo de verdad. Hi there, why not? I'm so glad you're here today. I've been watching your show, and you guys have been doing great. So, you saw when they turned me into a fossil? I did. And I also seem to recall that you said paleontology was the study of pales? Oh, uh, yeah, that was a joke. Uh-huh, okay, if you say so. Well, you all have been talking about fossils. Fossils tell a great and wonderful story. Then we could take a look at clues from living animals, things like teeth and diet, and reconstruct how animals and organisms in the past use those to adapt and survive. Okay, so I know there are two different basic types of fossils, body fossils and trace fossils. What's the difference? So body fossils are like what you made out of Kennet in the simulator. Body fossils are actual parts of an organism, things like bones and teeth, wood and leaves. So things like bones, you can actually take those and figure out and reconstruct how large a dinosaur or creature was in the past. Los huesos nos pueden decir qué tan grande era un dinosaurio u otro animal. <laughs> Gigantic, in some instances. The shape of the teeth indicates what type of food a creature ate. Carnivores or meat eaters have sharp teeth, like the edge of a knife. Their teeth were used for cutting through or tearing meat. Los dientes de los carnívoros son usados para arrancar la carne desde el hueso. And herbivores, or plant eaters, have flatter teeth used for crushing and grinding up plants. Sophia, I'll take the Spanish for this one. Los herbívoros. Herbívoros, exactly. Los comedores de plantas tienen dientes más planos que usan para aplastar y tritar. To a las plantas. a las plantas. Eso, Wow, you, you why nots are good and bilingual. You know, talking about plants, you can actually look at fossil leaves and tell things about past climates and environments. A higher proportion of trees with smooth edged leaves suggests warmer climate, whereas a higher proportion of jagged edged leaves suggests a cooler climate. Okay, those are things we can learn from body fossils. Now, what is a trace fossil? A trace fossil is any evidence of the past activity of an organism. So things like footprints or skin impressions. Or poop? Ew. Shwakala. <laughs> well, yeah, as a matter of fact, yeah. We call those coprolites. And what's neat, you can take a look at the insides of those and see what creatures were actually eating in the past. Still, ew, but okay. So footprints can tell us how dinosaurs walked, right? Right, they can tell you how they walked. They can also tell you how fast they walked. You can measure the distance between tracks, compare that to the size of the animal, and it'll tell you how fast it was going at the time. That is awesome! So, fossils can also help tell us about environmental changes, like floods or droughts. Y los fósiles pueden ayudarnos a saber sobre cambios ambientales, como inundaciones o sequías. That's exactly right. We can take a look at all the body and trace fossils from an area, and they can help us learn how some species really thrived in the past, while others didn't do so well, and they eventually went extinct as the planet and the world around them changed over time. Over time, that gives me a great idea. What's that? Well, I wanna show everyone how much the planet has changed. But, well, there's only room for three where we're going. 
Dr. Ron, gracias. Thank you so much for spending time with us. You're welcome. But I think I know where this is going. I'll save you later. Don't worry, Kenneth. We're all getting in it together this time. We'll be right back. Kenneth, I finished programming the Why Not One Copter simulation inside the simulator. So, you know what that means. Now I can travel. Oh, back in time. Te regreso en el tiempo. Vámonos. We're going to go way back in time to see how the planet has changed. All things we've learned from studying fossils. In gay simulation, time travel. Destination, early Cretaceous period. Location, Dallas. Or the land that'll one day become Dallas. This definitely does not look like home. Definitivamente no se parece a casa. During this period, 145 to 100 million years ago, North Texas was located near the coastline of the Western Interior Seaway, a warm, shallow sea that stretched from today's Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean. Around 110 to 115 million years ago, giant long-necked sauropods like Sauroposeidon munched on tops of trees, while smaller dinosaurs like Tenontosaurus and Convolosaurus ate the plants at their reach, including some of the earliest flowers. And stalking them were meat eaters, like a wolf size and bird like Deinonychus and the multi ton Acrocanthosaurus. Of course, not every animal that lived there then was a huge dinosaur. Fossils show us there were plenty of crocodiles, turtles, lizards, frogs, salamanders, and fish that lived there too. This is so cool. We've got more to see. Jerry, engage Lake Cretaceous simulation. You got it. You guys may want to hang on. We've got about 30 million years to travel. 30 million años que recorrer. Oh man, remind me to never travel through time on an empty stomach. Tengo la panza toda revuelta. The late Cretaceous period lasted from 100 to 66 million years ago. Although dinosaurs roamed much of North America, they weren't roaming around in Dallas because the Western Interior Seaway was there. But giant mosasaur lizards were just swimming around. The water was warm too, like the Caribbean Sea is today. True, surf's up. Jerry. Hold on, guys. We're coming to the end of the Cretaceous period now. This might get a little bumpy. There was a mass extinction that occurred. Could have been a meteor. Could have been volcanoes. Hubo una extinción. Whatever it was, Earth's climate changed drastically. Pudieron ser meteoritos o volcanes, lo que provocó el cambio de clima. It was the end of all dinosaurs. Bummer. Well, technically, birds are dinosaurs, so dinosaurs didn't go extinct. There are still over 9,000 species of dinosaurs still alive today. And studying fossils helps us understand why some species go extinct, while others do not. That's right. Well, we did it, guys. Lo logramos. And remember, everyone, anyone can grow up to be a scientist. All you have to do is ask why. And, and why, why not? not? Por qué no?